So one of the major themes in, in my work is uniting analysis and number theory in sometimes non-traditional ways. And one of the ways that we're going to talk about today is Fourier analytic techniques in arithmetic statistics. So statistics for objects such as elliptic curves, polynomials, and fields. And in particular, we're going to see how number theory and analysis interact to count these objects. So the take home message today is that number, th number theory and analysis will team up to count things. And uh, teamwork is great. Today, we'll count two particular types of objects. We'll look at random polynomials, and I'll say a little more in a moment. And then the second thing that we'll look at is counting number fields. And one of the common themes, besides the fact that analysis and number theory will both play a role in, in counting these objects, is that the statements are, are fairly simple, yet they're um, notoriously difficult to, to prove, and uh, they relate to a lot of recent work in, in the area, so a very active area of research in arithmetic statistics. So since I write big, I already covered up half the board, but we will start talking about properly the random polynomials. And I'll write this down as motivation in that we expect a random <coughs> monic degree n polynomial with integer coefficients. So x to the n plus a n minus one, x to the n minus one through a zero to have a full Galois group, so to be irreducible and have full Galois group 100% of the time. So to have Galois group isomorphic to SN 100% of the time. And as mathematicians, we know that 100% of the time is not all of the time. This is some sort of asymptotic. So we can ask, how often does it fail? So the motivated question, which I'll write on the other board here, is how often does it fail this? And already, if you look at an undergraduate textbook and algebra like Dumbin and Foot, there's a discussion, a motivating discussion as to why most polynomials will have a Galois group SF. Are you going to tell us what you mean by random? Because it depends very much on how you order this. <laughs> so yes, we'll make this more, more uh, precise in a moment. And you can order this by discriminant or by yeah, height. And yeah, so we're, we're going to order this by, by height. So we'll, we'll put this word in quotes because we'll talk about it later, absolutely. And yeah, feel free to interrupt with questions. Uh, if I don't see your hand, just I'll let it out. All right, so now let's say what we mean by this. So to be precise, I love it when the audience anticipates what's going to come next. <laughs> Let E n of h be the number of polynomials f with height f bounded by h. And by height here, we mean the maximum of the absolute value of the coefficients. So this is the maximum of the a. And for simplicity, you can assume h is an integer, though it doesn't, it doesn't matter here. And Galois group not isomorphic to SN. And this is the object that we're going to study. So if we cover up this condition about the Galois group, then we're just counting polynomials in a box, and there are about h to the n of such polynomials. So the question is asking, when you remove the full Gala group uh, SN, what do you get? And the conjecture, which was recently solved by 
by Van der Waarden in 1936. <laughs> Was, What's that? The solution is recent, but the conjecture is not recent. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, did I spell, I'm like, did I spell the other words they wrong? I mean, that could happen. Just chuck us from the audience. Yeah, so the conjecture is not recent, the solution is recent. From 1936, <laughs> is that E and H is a big O of H to the N minus one. So the total, as a reminder, is big O of H to the N. So you get a power savings here in H. So that's the uh, conjecture from 1936. And as I said, it was recently solved. So before I talk about that, let me give a little bit of a history on um, this E and H. So it's some history. So you can use a version of Hilbert's irreducibility theorem to show that this count is actually little o of h to the n. And Van der Woerden actually made this explicit. And along with the conjecture, Van der Woerden actually showed, same paper, that you get big O of h to the n minus something here that depends on both h and little n. And thus the conjecture was posed. And it's fairly easy to show one direction and much more difficult to show the other direction. So the easy direction is to show that E and H is bigger than H to the N minus one. And the harder direction is what took almost a hundred years. Why does that about this result? I mean, if the exponent is allowed to depend on H, then it could be like one over log h, and you're not actually um, gaining more than a constant. So I don't remember exactly um, what the dependence was. So, yeah, I did this as somewhat of a cop out because I don't remember what the dependence was. Uh, but it was uh, making uh, Hilbert's result explicit. So I have to look up to see to see what that is. I actually believe this is derived from work of Hilbert that came after Van der Woerden, so that technically this is this was first. But one doesn't need as much um, heavy machinery to derive this from work of Hilbert. So the hard direction is the other way around. And I'm just going to list some of the, the works. Uh, a lot of people worked on this. And what's amazing about this is that some uh, very fundamental techniques were de developed for this problem. So Gallagher, for example, developed the large sieve for this problem in 1976. And this has a lot of uses outside of this particular, particular problem. So Gallagher was able to show H the n minus one half plus epsilon and introduce the large sieve in the process. In 2010, Zywina was able to remove the epsilon. So these epsilons are notoriously hard to remove and introduce the larger sieve, which also has other uses outside of this problem. And then in 2012, Dietman introduced a completely different style of methods using probabilistic LL theory um, and was able to show h to the n minus square root 2 plus 2. Let's see, did I, did I get that right? No, that's not right. The other way around. <laughs> the other way around. So this is uh, just a little bit more than one half. And as I said, the style techniques in this paper from 2012 were very different from the other two papers. Moreover, there's some other works that I'm leaving, leaving off. So Chow and Dietman were able to solve Van der Woerden's conjecture for all degrees less than or equal to four. And there was also some earlier works using, using other techniques. But hopefully this just gives uh, an idea that this problem has been worked on by a wide variety of people using a wide variety of, of te 
techniques, and these techniques have been useful well outside of this particular problem. So this is where uh, I got involved, and so I ran one of these AIM workshops, hence the uh, long author list. And we used a combination of analysis and number theory to, to make some progress on this. So this is myself, Isla Gaffney, Robert Lumpy Oliver, David Lauridiga, who is one person but has a hyphen in his name, George Chikan and Rushan Zhang. So this is in 2021. We are able to show roughly h to the n minus two thirds. And I leave a very little uh, spot on the board, but do you want to squeeze in that this has been recently solved by Mantra Bargava, also in 2021. And this completes the picture, at least for, for the original question asked. So Van der Woerden's conjecture is now true. Of course, there's a lot of interesting uh, follow-up questions that one can ask, and Manjo already addressed some of these in his paper. What's amazing is that the techniques here are highly different from the techniques here and the techniques of all the other authors as well. So this problem not only has intrinsic Excuse interest, me. but it's introduced I have a by question. variety. Question? Yes. Uh, is that, is, well, what's this? Yeah, it's Peter. How, what's the status of Igor Rubin's work, do you know? I don't know. OK. I don't know. I was hoping, yeah, maybe someone, someone here okay. <laughs> might know. Right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so that's where, yeah, that's where the history ends today. And uh, I'll talk about one of the, the features in our work, which is a modified Selberg sieve and sort of brings in some analysis and some number theory and say that how that's useful in this problem. So that's what I'll talk about next. Right. So unfortunately, I have to erase some of the motivation, but I know I could use the sideboards, but I'm not sure how visible they are to the audience. And erasing my name, hopefully you know who I am by now. All right, so I'm going to talk about a key feature in our work. And uh, this is an IMRN. So the key feature is a modified silver sieve. I expect this to have use outside of this problem as is a common theme in all these works up here. So currently thinking about that. So if you don't know what a Selberg sieve is, I know I have a lot of experts in the audience, but let me go ahead and just introduce a very simple example and then quickly show how this relates to what we actually wanted to count. So if we let lambda d be real, D is square free, lambda one is equal to one, and M is a natural number. Then claim that the characteristic function of M equals one is equal to the sum of the divisors of the Mobius function. I was thinking, what is my contribution to the multi multiplicative part of this conference? And it might simply be using the Mobius function at some point. Uh, so I don't claim this is this is that difficult, but it did fascinate me. And I took, of course, an elementary number theory that there's such perfect cancellation here as to give this function that's mostly zero and just one in one place. So the claim of the sieve is that you can bound this sum of divisors by a sum of sieve weights of d squared. And of course, this is a very simple thing to work with. This is a characteristic function. We know what it's like, but in reality, the things that you'll be trying to bound are, are much more difficult. And we will indeed apply this principle to our problem. So just to note that that right-hand side is indeed an upper bound. Um, this is an upper bound sieve. So the idea is to make an upper bound and then make it as tight as possible by choosing appropriately the lambdas. The right-hand side is the sum over D1. 
and D2, lambda D1, lambda D2. And this is the sum over E dividing F. The sum over E equals the LCM of D1, D2, lambda D1, lambda D2. And if you call this term here A to E, you can show that A to E is greater than or equal to zero, and A to one is one, so it indeed is an upper bound for that characteristic one. <coughs> Now, in reality, the things we'll be working with are much more difficult, but the same principles generally apply. And so this is what we first tried that wasn't quite good enough. We tried to do a standard Selberg sieve in this uh, fashion. So this was our first attempt. So our first attempt was that via a few reductions, we could reduce to counting polynomials F of height bounded by H with Galois groups strictly in the alternating group. Okay. So able to make the reduction to this, and we want to count these with weight one. So this is essentially this E and, e and H, which we are trying to count. And if you apply this type of principle, you can bound this above by a sum over F with height bounded by H. And then we want a condition that kind of mimics this. And so we put down a sum over D where F mod P is odd. I haven't defined this, but it relates to the polynomials we want to sit out, so those not in the alternating group for all p dividing d of lambda d squared. So if you just kind of look at this, each side has a sum over f height at most h. And then we essentially have something that looks like a characteristic function here and something that looks rather like this condition here. So this naive application of the Selbert's works. And it does give some savings on uh, the original work of Hilbert or Van der Waarden, but it won't do quite well enough, at least in our application of it, to beat the uh, current uh, bound at the time, which was deep. So we needed to introduce uh, some modification. Okay. And I think I can squeeze the modification. So first of all, let me indicate the modifications that we're going to do to this. So two modifications. The first one is we're going to count things with respect to weights. I won't really dwell on that, but it was useful in a technical sense. The second and bigger uh, modification is that we use a quadratic form instead of the sum sum of squares. Okay. And this was the much bigger modification and allowed us to improve on deep man's work. Okay. So our actual sieve, which appears in our paper, looks like this. So we'll still count F with height bounded by H. Gala group strictly contained in the alternating group. And then a very mild condition that the discriminant of the polynomial is non-zero. That's because we'll count things with respect to a weight, where we weight everything by these powers of two. Two to the number of distinct prime divisors of the discriminant is non-zero. Essentially, you can th just think of this as one because this isn't really the major modification here. The major modification is bounding this above by a quadratic form here, Q, Q lambda. And this quadratic form looks like this. So it's a sum over D1 and D2. It's a product over primes dividing the LCM of D1 and D2. And then we have terms here that involve the Mobius function over function fields. The point here is that these Mobius functions that appear offer a lot of cancellation. 
let me finish writing this and then I'll say a word as to why this quadratic form was so useful in this problem. So first of all, let me just rename this for a little simplicity here as psi LCM D1, D2. So what's so useful about these terms is that this Mobius function here can be minus one, one, or zero. This cancellation is very helpful because overall these terms can then be zero, one, or one half. The one half is really key here. If you don't introduce such a modification, you get terms that are essentially zero or one. You can't build up those one halves to approximate things really tightly. You instead have to just use one. If you have a lot of one halves that multiply together, you can get this to be really small, really tight approximation to what you're trying to do. So this Mobius function being in here is, is very useful. Because of the fact that these terms can be one half and those one halves can build up, we can also use the fact that the Fourier transform of this Mobius function uh, has really good decay. And so let me go ahead, can I pull this top board out? It's fixed. No, no, it's not. It's not working. Yeah. Positive definite form? Yeah, so it's going to be positive definite. Yeah, that's what I'm going to write next. I don't have enough room to squeeze it in. Does it have a known diagonalization? It's the margin for small. Well, the mar okay. <laughs> Does it have a known definition as a sum of squares? Uh, so we write it out in our paper, and I don't. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it is it is written down. Right. Um, well, yeah. why, why is it okay to focus on the case of Galois group in AN? So we were able to use some reductions via other work on related questions. Okay, so so there is some work in particular. So the question was, why, why can we focus on these gala group contained in the alternating group? So there was some work of uh, Chow and Yitman on some other cases. Which we could use. Can you particularly focus on the other constant case? Is, is the non-irreducible polynomial case known and easy? Or? So, so you can focus on you can focus on irreducible, absolutely. Um, the transitive case, so uh, the way Bargava does his argument is different, but he's also able to use some no reductions. That's not what we're using here. We're using specifically work of um, Chow and Demon in certain settings. So they were able to look at essentially all the other cases. So not being contained in the alternating group. And so we we're able to cite that. But there are other reductions to certain special cases, and that's what Bargava was able to use in his work. As I said, a lot of the works here are, are very different and use some, some different reductions and uh, different techniques. Um, so, but specifically, we were able to use this um, very recent work of Chow Deepman that covered the other cases. Okay, so this QF lambda, so I wrote it up there and there's more details in the paper, but let me just say, what are some of the key features of this, why it was important. So first of all, as Terry mentioned, this is a positive definite. Uh, definite quadratic form. And if I had a few minutes, I could probably show that for you. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely shown in the paper. The next thing, is that this Mobius function that appears mu yeah, has a really good Fourier transform. And this was uh, some earlier work of uh, going to get the name wrong, so I'm not going to say it, but one of the references in our paper uh, used uh, the best bounds for this Mo uh, Mobius function over function fields in terms of the Fourier transform. So you're able to take advantage of this particular function has nice Fourier decay. And in particular, the oscillation here is really what contributes to the decay. 
So you may wonder why a Mobius function shows up. And from an analysis perspective, the fact that this has a lot of good oscillation is what's contributing to its good Fourier decay. And third thing is that there's a lot of flexibility in choosing both this lambda d1 and lambda d2. So you get two choices here, lambda d1 and lambda d2. And you can optimize them by a sort of Lagrange multipliers type technique. Um, but having two here um, from the outset is, is really quite useful. So these facts combined together with the choice of the lambdas that we'll make later on to make progress on this problem. Mm -hmm. And so let me just close by roughly saying what the steps are before moving on to the next, uh, the next example, which is counting number fields. So the steps are some rough assembly here. So what you want to count this ENF is very roughly, again, with the reductions I said, the left-hand side of the sieve, you can bound this above roughly by the right-hand side of the sieve. And then you use uh, Poisson summation. So this is why that Fourier decay is so important. So the next step is use Poisson summation. So Poisson summation gives roughly. So we're counting polynomials here. What are we actually counting? We're looking at the coefficients of polynomials. So integer coefficients, when you do Poisson summation, you get a sum over integers u. We're summing over d1 and d2 of psi hat d1, d2. Now at u, lambda d1, lambda d2. Okay. So that's what Poisson summation gets. And now you can see if you believe this Poisson summation step, why those Fourier transforms are so helpful because they'll naturally appear when I'm taking the Fourier transform of psi. Okay. So combined with a choice of some index, capital D, this will depend on H such that lambda D is zero for all D bigger than capital D. And another choice of the other lambda d via some type of optimization, we're able to get um, the claimed bound of about h to the n minus two things. Yeah. Can you say that how you found this particular quadratic form? Uh, I found a particular quadratic form. So <laughs> First, we did that failed attempt, right? And we thought would be really useful is just that we had some flexibility in the problem. And we knew that those Mobius transforms have really good Fourier decay. So if there was a way to rephrase what we were trying to do in terms of Mobius functions. So we sort of had what our failed attempt was, and we sort of had what we wanted to do. It kind of worked backwards. And it was one of those things that having six authors on a paper was so useful, we could all pitch in and throw in different parts. And so eventually we were able to arrive there. So there's a connection between the odd polynomials and that Mobius function and the results we knew, and we could, we could sort of bridge the gap there. We also uh, asked uh, Will Sowen, who uh, provided a, 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 useful, a useful tip. Um, so he's not an author on the paper, but uh, he was very helpful and alerting us of certain results. Thank you. So yeah, one of those like, you know, magic in a room kind of things, except this is all virtual. So there was no, there's no room. <laughs> Other questions, because I'm going to move on to number fields. So it's a perfect time to pause for any questions on this, this part. Are, are there any like limitations to HA and minus one? Are there any what limitations? Are, like, what are sort of the limitations? Oh, to, to yeah. doing better than what we did. Um, 
The fact that Mar Manjo Bhargava is very brilliant and came up with a totally different method right after we did this. That was that was part of it. Um, but in going back and looking at what we did, um, it seems hard to to push this to push this down lower without coming up with a different sieve. In some ways, we felt like this was pretty optimal. In going through the sieve, you try to optimize the choices of the sieve weights, lambdas, the choice of D here. We felt like we had really pushed things to the best of our ability. Um, but anyway, when the conjecture is proved shortly, shortly after using using totally different techniques, um, that that also uh, allowed us to to switch gears in a sense and start thinking about if these techniques were useful in other problems as opposed to trying to see how far we can push this. But yeah, in hindsight, it, it looks like this is pretty much the limit of our methods. So that was at least nice to know. <laughs> that was the, there's a real gap between the left hand side of the sieve and the right hand side of the sieve in this fluid application. Um, you said you can optimize the sieve, you can optimize the right hand side of the sieve, but mm -hmm. it gives you the wrong power of H uh, compared to what you expect the left hand side. Yeah. Oh, for, for the first attempt, or are you talking about down here? <laughs> yeah, so you're saying that, that the right side, so it optimizes H to N minus two thirds, but the left side is expected to be H to N minus one. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Yeah, I do think it would be interesting to see if some variation on these techniques could also replicate the result. Um, but perhaps this is best with a a few years uh, in between, a little more hindsight as to seeing the effectiveness of this technique, these techniques in other areas. Then we'll learn more about it and see if we can go back and make, make it better. Any other questions before I move on to the second part? And feel free to, you know, if you think of something later, uh, feel free, I'm happy to, happy to jump back. All right. Okay, so the second part of the talk will be about counting number fields. And the techniques are a bit different here, but I do have to say that the inspiration was working on this problem and thinking. Uh, actually, this was this was a question asked by a referee of the uses of this particular type of sieve in in other problems and where we thought where we sort of saw, saw this thing going, and so we started talking about if we could apply this modified Selberg sieve to counting number fields, and even though we we didn't end up doing that, that's where the inspiration for this next project came from. Right. So the second part of the talk will be on counting number fields. And let me motivate this. So I'm speaking to number theorists, so I don't think I need to motivate this as much, but let me go ahead and, and motivate it anyway. So we have a very simple question. Is that we want to count NNX, which is going to be the number of extensions of the rational's finite degree n and discriminant, which I'll say a little more about later, bounded above an absolute value by x. So this is a very natural question as to um, counting number fields ordered by a discriminant. You can count them ordered by other things, but this one's very natural and we're far way off from the conjecture in this case. So the conjecture is that for any degree that we get O of X. So I'm not going to say anything about the constant here, but essentially for any degree, the count of number of fields should be uh, independent in terms of the power uh, on x on the degree n. And the starting point is work of Ermi and Minkowski, and that is x to the n. So at least if you're starting from here, you're quite a ways off. So this is bounded above by x to the n. 
Yeah, so it's finite, so that's good. So you'll learn that algebraic number theory class. Uh, usually you'll talk about this type of a bound, but the conjecture is uh, definitely a lot, a lot better than, um, than what is known. But we do know this in a few cases. We do know this conjecture. So this is known for degrees two, three, four, and five. And in fact, secondary terms are known, and there's a lot of work uh, done on these cases. So this is uh, classical. This is work of Davenport and Halbrock. And then degrees four and five are um, due mainly to Mandel Bargava. So these are what I will call the small degrees. We also know for the large degrees, um, not quite the conjecture, um, but the very recent work, large degrees, showed that this is bounded by O of x to the c log squared n. I believe that's correct where C is some explicitly computable constant, and this is the best uh, known. So this is due to Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne. So this builds off of work of Ellenberg and, and Venkatesh and some recent advantage, uh, advances for large degrees. So you might ask what I mean by large. Um, as I said, that constant's explicitly uh, computable. So this is the best when uh, the degree is bigger than bigger than 96. So it's not very large. <laughs> so this is very useful. So degree is bigger than 96. So uh, these these techniques kick in. But you might ask, even though the middle range isn't that big, you might ask what's the best known there. So up until recently, the best work was uh, known uh, known for middle degrees by, by Schmidt. So middle degrees, is there degrees from six to 94? So work of Schmidt in 1995 was the state of the art. And this just saved a little bit on the airmate Wankowski estimate x to the n plus two over four. So just a uh, multiplicative savings in, in the power. And Schmidt after, oh, is there a question? No, no question. No. Um, anyway, Schmidt was able to uh, count essentially polynomials, and we'll see a little later in the talk, uh, sort of what Schmidt did. It's a very clever argument, switching between counting discriminants and number fields to counting polynomials. But that's sort of the best that one can do by doing Schmidt's method. And then in 2022, so just last year, uh, on April Fool's Day, so I'll write this so April 1st, 2022, in a coordinated effort, myself with a similar team, but uh, some additions and some additions. Uh, and uh, let's see. So myself, Isla Gaffney, Robert Lemke Oliver, David Laura Duda. Oh, I missed uh, Kevin Hughes. <laughs> Let me start over. So Isla Gaffney, Kevin Hughes, Robert Lemke Oliver, David Laura Duda, Frank Thorne, Julia Wong, and Rishak Jung. So team of eight authors now. Um, we're able to show x to the n plus two over four and a little bit of savings here, four n minus four. And then on the same day, Bhargava, Shankar, and Wong, different Wong, this is Jerry Wong, this is Julia Wong, are able to show x to the n plus two over four minus one over two n minus two plus a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so yes, this is a coordinated effort. It wasn't like an April Fool's trick that we played on each other. Um, but what's interesting, again, about this problem is that besides a few basic structural similarities, the techniques are actually quite different. So again, having two different groups using two different techniques, um, one begs the question of how are these useful beyond this problem? So that's something that... Um, We'll be thinking about, in fact, after here I go to aim to hopefully think about that.
So what I'll talk about today is a little bit about uh, one of the key features in this work and how it's useful for this problem. So, what's one of the key features here? Well, I think this is of interest a little more widely. Um, several months after we wrote this paper, we finally discovered that this part of this key feature is, is, is known, previously known, so it's very exciting. Um, it can be found in a textbook app. But how we were able to use it, um, as to the best of my knowledge, is new. And so I'll motivate that by switching to talking about the polynomial discriminant. So we have the discriminant of the number field. It's related to the discriminant of polynomial that cuts out the number field. I'll write that down explicitly uh, momentarily. But let's just hop back to polynomial discriminants, because these are hopefully familiar to, to everyone. So a key feature is that polynomial discriminant. So you can think of this as pertaining to a number field, but you can even just think of this in terms of any polynomial, uh, has a really nice arithmetic progression property in terms of its gradient. So I'll just write this down as arithmetic progression property for now, or a p for short, and I'll tell you what this is. So as a reminder, uh, if f is just a quadratic polynomial with integer coefficients, one can calculate its discriminant. So, just b squared minus 4c. And this tells you about the root structure of the polynomial. So more generality, the discriminant will still tell the same thing. In this case, one can very easily take derivatives of the discriminant with respect to the coefficients, because the discriminant is a polynomial in terms of the coefficients of the original polynomial. So we can take derivative of this with respect to the coefficient b and derivative of this with respect to the coefficient c. And if one starts doing this for higher degree polynomials, one might start to notice some patterns. And this is what we were starting to see. However, it gets computationally quite complicated to work with discriminants. So if you look online or type it into stage, you can see how the discriminant quickly grows in terms of complexity. So in general, if f is degree n polynomial of the following form, uh, then we can still compute these discriminants, it just gets more complicated. And we can call this dr as the derivative of the discriminant with respect to the coefficient cr. And what we were hopeful when we were looking at this for our particular problem is that there's some sort of structure when you're computing all of these derivatives that one can take advantage of in terms of counting the polynomials that underlie the number fields that we want to count. And so this fact that we showed in our paper and that much later we found out was, was, was already known is that the discriminant divides this product of derivatives for everywhere that these coefficients make sense. So the discriminant divides the rth derivative times the s derivative minus the r plus l minus times the s minus l for all r, s, and l in the natural range. And this is quite a beautiful fact about the structure of the of the discriminant and of its gradient. And this is something we didn't know, so we, we went ahead and proved it. As much later, we found out that this was, this was in a book. If one accepts this fact, which definitely is not obvious, then if a prime power 
power is p to the 2k. So if you take a, a prime to some power, 2k divides the discriminant polynomial. So if you're looking at divisibility, this translates to a congruence condition on that product there. What you get is then dr ds minus dr plus l. S minus L is congruent to zero mod P to the 2K. If you choose R and S to be equal and L to be one, so for R equals S, L equals one, this becomes dr squared minus dr plus one, dr minus one. And then if one looks at the powers of the prime P in terms of the valuation, then one gets a condition that brings down these exponents. So if VIP is the evaluation, so the highest power of P that divides the term DI's valuation of DI at P, we get that VR times Two now that two drops down minus v r plus one plus v r minus one is equal to zero mod two k. If one simply decides to ignore the, this condition, you can rearrange, and this implies that v r minus v r minus one is equal to v r plus one minus v r. And if this is true for all r, this indicates a common difference. So a common difference. And this indicates an arithmetic progression. So the fact is that the gradient of the discriminant has p's appearing with the v i in an arithmetic progression. So the gradient d1 dn has p with vip in an arithmetic progression. So that's a lot of structure. And that's what we'll use in our problem. So next, I'll say how this is useful. And then we'll close up the talk. So how is this? of the polynomial discriminant with gradient, very sort of geometric property here, helpful in counting these number fields. Well, I mentioned that the polynomial discriminant and the number field discriminant are very closely related, but I haven't written that down yet. So let me write that down because in many cases they're the same. And when they differ, there's a means to measure how they differ. So we're going to do some assembly. As a reminder, fx will be polynomial x to the n. Of the following form. Here we're going to measure the height differently. Height of f is going to be the maximum of the coefficients weighted properly to the 1 over i. So it's very natural to consider this height as well. And with this in mind, the fact is that the polynomial discriminant is equal to the number field discriminant times the degree of the ring of integers over z adjoined a root of the minimal polynomial squared. This term here is called the index, and it measures how different the number field discriminant and polynomial discriminant are. For many cases, it's one. And then if you want to count number fields, you can count polynomials, but for a lot of cases, it's not. In a sense, these exceptional cases are what we have to watch out for if instead of counting number fields, we want to count polynomials. Counting polynomials doesn't seem that hard. We can just count polynomials in a box. 
but those exceptions are, are what come come out to bite us. So every k in n at x, so every number field with discriminant bounded by x, is cut out by a polynomial of bounded height. And this is what the height's bounded by. So if you want to count k here, we can simply count f up to that height, but that's not as efficient as we would like. And in some sense, this is a quite clever way of doing things. This is what Schmidt did. So if one wants to do better, we have to uh, take care of the exceptions. But a typical f with height equal to h has discriminant that is too big. It has discriminant f about discriminant k, they're equal, and roughly x to the n over 2. So this is too big. So by doing things this way, we are counting, we are counting way too many things. So exceptional, exceptional f, f slash k, have either the discriminant, which is much smaller than x to the n over 2. So discriminant much smaller, and what we want is less than x. Or they have a very large index, so a large difference between the polynomial and number field discriminant. The index can be large in a variety of ways. So it could be large because it has a lot of prime factors. Or it could be large because it's divisible by a large uh, power of a prime. So one way, one way this happens is if p to the 2k divides the index via a sleight of hand, which I won't go into, we can replace this actually by the discriminant. And if this is the case that you're in, then we know something about the structure of the gradient of this, the discriminant. So if p to the 2k divides the discriminant, then the gradient has a lot of structure. The gradient has a lot of structure. This is useful in the Fourier side of a counting problem. Okay, this structure is useful when we apply Poisson summation. When Poisson summation is applied. So in particular, we're looking at characteristic functions in our work of primes dividing the discriminant. And when one applies Poisson summation, the structure of the underlying discriminant, the support of these characteristic functions gives us Fourier decay. So good support properties means good Fourier decay. And this allows us to get the savings over Schmidt. As I mentioned, the work of the other authors, Bhargava, Shankar, uh, and Wong is quite different in many of the steps. And I anticipate that some of the techniques from, from both papers will be useful beyond on this context and after here I go to aim to think about that. So I think I will I will close there and open up to questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your beautiful talk. Questions or comments? Yeah so is there any reason why um, we should expect like the the number of number fields to be all of x. So I am fairly new to studying this problem. So I think there are definitely some heuristics out there. It is quite amazing that it this is expected to be independent of the degree. So I don't think I know a good reference offhand. I probably have to look into this. So my first foray into, into this problem came rather recently after the other work. So I was amazed in the one work uh, that power is extremely dependent on n, but in this work, the expectation is that um, 
that it's not dependent. Uh, I believe there are, are definitely heuristics out there where this should be true, but I, I don't know offhand uh, what to quote. Uh, so I, I was definitely a bit surprised myself. And I think the, the, the fact that we're a long way off indicates this is, this is a very hard conjecture. To make things even worse, the bound O of X is expected without any condition on the degree. So if you take all number fields of all degrees with discriminant up to X, it's expected to be O of X, not only for a fixed degree. I think the uh, uh, original conjecture of, uh, for fixed degree X to power one is Linux. And I could find it for you if you want. Okay. <laughs> Probably Schmidt, probably Schmidt uh, refers to Linux. But anyway, I, I, I remember it used to go by Linux conjecture. Okay, thank you. And, and he might give some, his heuristics. Yeah, I mean, as you say, many heuristics, but it'd be interesting to see what Linux said. More questions? Well, if that's not the case, thank you very much for your talk.